Everyone, welcome to the Georgia Tech Manufacturing Institute's Spring Lunch and Learn Seminar Series. My name is Paige Shi. I'm the Strategic Partners Officer for GTMI. GTMI is one of Georgia Tech's 11 interdisciplinary research institutes. We uniquely focus on manufacturing research, developments, and deployments. We help tackle the grand challenges of today's manufacturers and assist our partners in moving innovations from the lab to the market. GTMI has a wide variety of facilities and equipment located on the main campus for basic research, as well as nearby on 14th Street for applied research in our advanced manufacturing pilot facility, also known as MPF. GTMI's mission uh, includes education and workforce training, collaborative partnerships with industry, academia, and government, as well as thought leadership. GTMI hosts the Lunch and Learn series each semester. This spring, our Lunch and Learn sessions will be held every Monday at noon as live online events. And we welcome our Georgia Tech faculty, undergraduate and graduate level students and researchers, as well as our growing global manufacturing community to learn and share advanced manufacturing knowledge through this series. Today, to ensure a smooth presentation experience, audience members are automatically muted. If you have questions or comments for the speaker, we encourage you to uh, submit those through the Q&A panel on your screen. And we will address all the questions uh, that come in at the end of the lecture. Today, I'm very pleased to introduce uh, Mr. Gary McMurray, who will discuss manufacturing and unstructured environments. Gary McMurray is a principal research engineer and division chief for the Intelligent Sustainable Technologies Division at the Georgia Tech Research Institute, commonly known as GTRI. He is also an associate director for the Institute for Robotics and Intelligent Machines, or IRM, at Georgia Tech. IRM serves as an umbrella under which robotics researchers, educators, and students from across campus can come together to advance the many high-powered and diverse robotic activities at Georgia Tech. The Intelligent Sustainable Technology Division conducts innovative research to improve the human condition through transforming the agricultural and food systems, sustainable use and access to energy and water, and safety of people at work and from pandemics. Mr. McMurray's research has focused on the development of robotic technologies and solutions for the manufacturing and agribusiness communities, including the protein, fruit, and vegetable industries. He is an expert in the use of vision for the real-time control of robotics and the author of over 50 refereed technical papers and journal publications in robotics. Mr. McMurray serves on the advisory board for the Advanced Animal Systems for the Foundation of Food and Agricultural Research. He also serves on the board of directors for the Robotics Industry Association. So welcome, Gary. Uh, you may now begin your presentation. All right. Well, good morning, everybody. Uh, it's it's uh, great to be here. I really want to say thank you uh, to GTMI, uh, to Paige and the team for, uh, for helping me uh, get this set up and for this opportunity. Um, so I'm going to be talking about manufacturing in unstructured environments. And what I'm going to try to do is give you a, a feel for the work that not only that I am doing, but also the, the broader team that I work with. So not all research is exactly mine, but I, it is the team that um, that I work with. So I, I hope you'll find it to be interesting, and I look forward to your questions uh, at the end. So with that, let's get started. So first of all, I just want to talk a little bit about what the George Tech Research Institute is. Um, first of all, GTRI is the acronym we use, is the contract research arm for Georgia Tech. So what that means is we are uh, part of Georgia Tech, and therefore we actually share resources and share projects with the academic side. So almost all the projects that you'll be hearing uh, from this uh, presentation uh, has some collaboration with the academic side as well, whether it be graduate students or academic faculty working on the projects as well. And one of the things that GTRI is really good about doing is since we are the applied research arm for George Tech, we, we are able to integrate the basic research and the applied research to do something really different and novel for our customers. Uh, also, as you see here, uh, some numbers about uh, just how big we are, and what we do. Uh, last, um, last year we did about 600 and uh, this is from FY19 numbers, but last year we did somewhere about $660 million in research awards. So we're over half of the research awards at uh, Georgia Tech. Uh, we're over 2,000 people now. I think we're close to now close to 2,600 people. Uh, so it's a good sized organization uh, with a lot of resources and a lot of depth. And I think that that's one of the things which is really interesting about uh, GTRI is the, the depth of the teams. 
And also you can see um, we are uh, a UARC, which is a university affiliated research center where uh, the Army's largest one. So therefore, as you might imagine, the majority of the work that we do is with the DOD. And if you look at the awards, you can see Air Force, Army, Navy, <laughs> it certainly represents the majority of our customers. Uh, the work that we do in this division and the work that I'll be sharing, um, most of our stuff is not um, classified work. As, as a matter of fact, none of it is classified. We do a little bit of work for the military, but it's in logistics in these areas. Um, so it's not the traditional areas, but we also work with a lot of other uh, government organizations. So we have worked with NSF, USDA, and these types of organizations. So as you see, um, the other federal, which is those organiz organizations that I just mentioned, is obviously a small part of what we do. But I think it's actually a very significant um, piece um, of the work that GTRI does. Uh, GTRI is divided into uh, eight laboratories. And as you can see here, uh, you know, you get a feel for the kinds of work that GTRI does. It's a, it is dominated by the military side. Um, you can see the radar systems is certainly one of the uh, bread and butter areas that GTRI works. Uh, but we also work in cybersecurity and sensors. And that's actually something which has been very useful uh, to the work that we do is just the work in sensors of taking some of the stuff from the military and being able to apply it into non-military applications. And then, as was kind of mentioned uh, in the summary, uh, the division that I um, that I lead, you know, we have a different um, a different vision for what we do than maybe the rest of GTRI. And I think this really flows in well with the, the mission of Georgia Tech. And because in the new strategic plan that Georgia Tech has put out, it really is really focuses on improving the human condition, and that's something which is very important um, to the work that we do. Uh, we do it by transforming, as I mentioned, ag food and agriculture, uh, sustainable use and access to energy and water, and safety of, of, of people at work and from pandemics. Uh, certainly, given what's happened in the past year, uh, it's, it's not a surprise that we would be working in the pandemic area. Uh, it's, it's a lot of opportunities and a lot of applications for robotics and sensors, um, but also the safety of people at work. This is, um, this is where we are deploying robots into manufacturing environments because uh, a lot of times we're, we're using people in, you know, traditionally, it's always been the dirty, dull, uh, dangerous uh, activities where the robots have been placed. Now we're trying to use robots in other applications, but still manufacturing is one of those core areas where we really are trying to get more robots in there, but it faces significant challenges. And that's some of the things that I'll be talking about today. Uh, in the division, I just want to kind of give you a, a feel for what we do. Um, you see here on the left are strategic investments. We have two large state-funded programs, uh, the Agricultural Technology Research Program and Environmental Sustainability Programs, and then our IRAD dollars. This is where we make our investments in our basic research. And these are the critical technologies that we work. You see the robotics, the chemical and biological systems, energy and materials, machine learning and data analytics and systems engineering. And then we bring these technology areas uh, together and apply them into a number of different application areas. On the right-hand side, you see kind of a sampling of those application areas. So we work in a lot of different areas, transportation, poultry, agriculture, uh, also D&D manufacturing, uh, energy systems, and pandemic response. As I said, this is what I think what makes GTRI very, very unique, is our ability to bring together diverse skill sets uh, in technology areas and apply them in very unique ways for our partners. And that's, um, I'll be showing you some of the things that I think are really unique and novel in the manufacturing space um, for today's presentation. So uh, first of all, I just want to start off with, you know, what I, what I call, you know, robots 1.0. You know, this is the traditional, you know, use of robotics. You know, robotics has been very successful in being deployed in, in the automotive and electronics um, assembly processes. And they work really well there because they're able to really con constrain the environment. You're dealing with parts which are very well defined. Okay, so if you go to an automotive plant, like on that top, you know, uh, uh, picture there, you know, the cars, they're on rails. They're very well defined. Every part, there's a CAD drawing for it. So you know exactly what the size of every part is ahead of time. And you can force the parts to be exactly where you want them to be. Okay, so the robots are doing very complex tasks, but they're doing a single task. They're doing that same task all the time. Um, one of the jokes that one of my colleagues has is the only people who use the uh, the dexterity and the multi 
purpose uh, use of a robot is the manufacturer. Because most people, most companies, when they buy a robot, they put the robot in, just like in that picture, and that robot does one task. And that that one task forever and ever. Okay? And that works great in automotive and electronics. Okay? Because they're doing its mass production. Okay? They're rolling out the same things. And, you know, there's some variations in cars. I get that. But in generally, you know, it's painting. It's always going to be painting, you know, basically the same type of vehicles. Okay? So what we really want to be able to do is say, all right, this works great there, but there's so many other applications that we'd like to, to be able to do. And how do we develop the robots and the, and the intelligence of the, the systems to be able to allow them to move out from just these types of applications? You know, so now today you see robots being moved out and, and doing things in all kinds of different environments now. You know, we typically use the phrase, you know, the robots have, have left the cages. Um, in the traditional manufacturing, and they're being used in agriculture, uh, logistics, in the home, space, um, you know, other manufacturing, you know, uh, the, the biomedical world. So the robots are being used in a lot of different areas. And the key piece of that is the autonomy, okay? And the autonomy is really of the robot to be able to sense this environment, to make intelligent decisions, and then react and do the right thing. OK, so right now, uh, a lot of the autonomy intelligence is very simple. Uh, if you look at the Roomba robot um, that, that uh, vacuums your floor, it has very simple intelligence. It drives into it, you know, runs up against something and then it turns around. You know, now they've actually added some intelligence. So it actually builds a map of the environment as it moves around. But it's still very limited in its use of that map. OK, but uh, it works very effectively. OK, for that application. But how do we get it to do other things? And if you look at any manufacturing environment, there are still hundreds of people doing various tasks. And those people are there doing the task because the robots can't do those tasks yet. OK, and, and a lot of that comes down to the fact that they're working in an unstructured environment. There's something about that task which is different and unique every time it's being done. And that makes it very hard for the robot to do. So um, when we talk about manufacturing and instruction environments, what kinds of things am I talking about? Well, typically we're looking at applications where the objects to be manipulated are wet, slippery, slippery, deformable, and there's no CAD model for them. Okay. Um, some of the things that we talk about is you know, work we do in the poultry industry. And while the poultry industry is not the most glamorous of industries, it is incredibly rich in these types of really challenging problems. In this case, if you think of a breast fillet, picking up a breast fillet on a belt, there is no CAD model for a breast fillet, okay? Because it's a natural, uh, it's a naturally varying product, okay? It's biology, so everything's going to be a little bit different. You know, we're working in environments that cannot be completely controlled or refined. High variability of the product. And what's really interesting is this is the majority of the world, okay? So um, we really want to be able to, to solve the majority of the problems that are out there. So the goal that we have here at GTRI and George Tech is we want to make the robots more intelligent and able to respond to their environments without human intervention. And that's really the important part is how do we do this without people. So I'm going to I'm going to jump. I'm going to talk about a couple of different projects. And this is one that uh, Stephen Belikersky has been leading um, with um, the Marine Corps. And they had a problem that they want to be able to uh, supply their uh, troops in the field, okay? And the problem is, um, is how do you automate this, this whole process? And when you look at it, some of these problems are really big. The, just a simple thing of moving ammunition is, first of all, ammunition is really heavy, okay? It takes two, you know, two big, um, uh, you know, people to move some of these boxes. OK, and you see there every time they build a pallet, they ship to a, a base or a unit. It's a very unstructured because it's it varies every time. It's the rainbow pallet, you know, problem, which is, you know, it's a variety of different products to go on there. So it's very unstructured. It has to go through um, a, a difficult supply process, put it onto a truck, being transported out to the field. So um, so we started working on this problem. And one of the things we looked at is, is how do you. Do the, the the packing. So how do we how do we optimize that pallet? So it was the first thing that uh, Steve and the team worked out, and they worked on some simulations that we have running here. 
And uh, using various analytical tools, we've come up with some algorithms which will allow us to be able to create the packing patterns in a matter of a minute. This allows us to create these two robotic arm systems that you see here that work collaboratively together to be able to do the packing. Okay, what you see here is a one six degree of freedom robotic arm and one seven degree of freedom robot. And so the seventh degree of freedom is a rail which allows the system, the robot to move along um, that, that rail. Uh, this system is using a very novel uh, system of being able to, uh, a corner finding routine. So the, the box will actually, the end effector will actually find the corner and then grab. So it's not relying on vision processing. Um, it's using the, and then once it grasps the part, it moves it to a staging station where the second robot can pick it up. Okay. And then that robot actually using the, um, the, the tool that we, I discussed before about creating the pallet, it can then optimize the placement of the parts to create this rainbow pallet. And it can actually do very, very tight uh, fitting of, of the product because it actually uses an algorithm where as it goes down, it actually moves over to find the, the other box. And once it kind of bumps that box, then it places it down at the correct location. And one of the things I should say, um, since this video was made, we've actually, Steve and his team has, has made some improvements to the system where their two robotic arms actually are running at the same time. And this really increases the throughput of the system. Um, but this is a really cool system because it shows how the robots can work together to be able to increase the throughput of the system in a very unique way. And what's really interesting, this is fully implemented in ROS, which is the robotic operating system. And this allows us to be able to use different types of robots. And then one of the other things we've been looking at, which I think is, is interesting, is the use of two arms to be able to manipulate uh, boxes. So you see right here is two robots uh, picking up a box and moving it. And what's really interesting about this is there's no force sensing required. It's pure position-based control. And we are optimized, we are actually controlling each of the robots pass in real time so that they um, manipulate that box, okay? So um, this shows the ability of, of the robots to work together to actually perform unique task. And this is really interesting in the logistics area. So um, this is another application where the robots are actually picking up a, an object, which alone individually is too heavy for the robot to pick up. But together, they can pick up the object and move it. And the thing about this in the logistics world is typically um, what, com what companies will do is they'll spec out a robot uh, based upon the largest payload uh, that would be picked up by that robot. So therefore, 99% of the time, the robot is handling product, which is much lighter. Oops, didn't mean to jump ahead there. Which is much lighter than it could do uh, normally. Also, that large robot is probably a little bit slower, okay? So you have a single robot, which is more expensive um, than maybe it should be performing at that task. What we're proposing here is that you can actually have two robotic arms that are working together. Now, for 95% of the products, uh, each robot could handle the payload of the products. So they could be working individually, okay? So now you have two robots running, so you're essentially getting you know, almost twice the throughput. But then when you get the heavy payload, or that one box comes, which is really heavy, the robots can now work together, pick up that box, and, and, and handle it, okay? So you, for the cost of two robots, which is probably less than um, the, the cost of a single robot to handle the higher payloads, um, now you're getting twice the throughput, okay? And that's a really interesting um, proposition that we think uh, for the logistics world. And so we've shown two different ways that we can actually um, handle that problem. So next I wanna talk about is some work in the, the poultry industry. And this is a, a project that we've been working for over a number of years, and this is work that was funded by the state of Georgia through the Agricultural Technology Research Program. And this task right here, what we show is the shoulder cut of a bird. And what's really interesting about this is, in some ways, it's very similar to when you carve a turkey for the holidays. You know, what, you, what the worker is doing is looking at the bird, making some assumptions about where the joint is, just like if you were carving a turkey, you would estimate where you think the bone is. Then you put the knife in, you feel 
for the, in this case, the joint, and then you make your cut, okay, along there. And what's really interesting about this is obviously the person's doing it at a, at a very high rate of speed. The person's making the, these estimates very quickly. This is a very challenging problem in the industry. Uh, this is a really important problem because it, it affects a number of different aspects of the business. Uh, number one is it affects the uh, the yield of this cut directly affects, uh, the, I'm sorry, the quality of the cut directly affects the yield of the breast meat. The breast meat is the highest um, commod highest valued product that, they, that comes off of the bird. It turns out that 1% yield loss of, of the bird for a single processing plant equates to about one and a half million dollars of lost revenue per plant on a, on a yearly basis. In the state of Georgia, we have 20 processing plants. Um, so it, it's a lot of money that is being left on the table. Especially when the human does it, they're, they're losing several percentage points of yield. So it becomes a really big economic problem. But it's a really hard problem to solve. So one of the approaches that we've taken is um, it really kind of started off some work from Leonardo da Vinci. Um, da Vinci showed back in the, in the Renaissance that there's there's certain relationships which hold up with the human body. Uh, for instance, if you stretch out your arms, you know, from finger to finger, that's how tall you are. Okay, and there's a number of ratios like that in the human body. Well, it turns out that these there are similar ratios in poultry. And what we were able to do is look at external parameters and then be able to estimate the internal structure of the bird. Okay, so this internal structure is where the bones and the ligaments are. Okay, and those are things that we want to be able to cut. So what we've created is an imaging system um, that so we have here, you have a camera here, so the, it can actually image the bird and it can predict where the internal structure of that bird is. From that internal structure, we can create a unique cutting trajectory for every bird. Remember, these are actual chickens which are being uh, raised. So every bird is unique, okay? Even though um, the breeding programs have done a fantastic job about trying to get consistency in the birds, there's still just a tremendous variation in the, in the size and the weights of the birds. So therefore, this system tries to look at the birds, figure out where the joint is, and then estimate and create a unique cutting trajectory for that, for that bird. And then once it starts doing the cut, it relies on some controls algorithms such that when it begins to hit the bones and things like this, it can change that cutting trajectory in real time to be able to truly optimize uh, that path and avoid bone chips. Uh, bone chips are a, really a big problem for the industry. Um, you know, no one wants to bite into their Chick-fil-A sandwich and bite into a bone. So you really want to be able to minimize this. So having this type of hybrid force position control really allows us to be able to avoid those bone chips. And now this is actually a, a video of the system working. Uh, this is at our laboratory. We've actually taken it out into the field, uh, working in a processing facility, uh, but I don't want to show that uh, for um, for other reasons uh, for uh, the, with the NDA. But this actually shows the system working uh, in our in our um, facility. So you can see it's it's the imaging system is upstream from this. It's taking the pictures. It's creating a unique cutting trajectory for every bird. What we have found from these tests is that we can actually match the performance of the human. Okay, the best cutter. And that is really, really impressive. And what's even better is one of the things that we found over time is, and as I'm sure this is no surprise to you, that if you are standing on that processing line doing that cut, like I showed at the, that, that first video, um, you might you would start off the day doing really, really well. But I guarantee within an hour, two hours, your performance is going to start to drift. And here it's going to drop. And certainly when you come you know, when you come back from lunch, you'll be re-energized, refocused, but by the end of the day, your performance is really gonna drop. These robots are always gonna be doing the same all day long. So from a uh, production point of view, this type of uh, solution is really, really interesting to the industry. And this is actually one of the, um, the toughest problems in the industry. So one of those holy grail projects, if you will. So, the uh oh I seem to have had a crash. 
Done. Okay, we'll get back here. Sorry about that. Wow, my system is not cooperating with me. Okay, so one of the things we're also looking at, I mentioned, you know, pandemic response, is looking at robots to do um, germicidal irradiation. So, you know, right now there's a lot of work being used in fogging uh, systems and things like this, and that works well in in an environment like an office building or a hospital. But we're also actually very concerned about what about park benches? What about playgrounds? What about, you know, everything that's outside in the real world? So we've been working with this of using robots, um, being able to identify what the object is um, using 3D scanning. This, we're actually using some, some markers to make it easy for the initial test. Um, and then you can build that model of what the object is you want to be able to um, to irradiate. And now we have a UV light. We can maintain a, uh, that uh, robot, that light, very close to the surface and essentially paint the surface. And what you see here down below uh, with these two um, images, those are dishes where we actually are growing. Um, this, we're using some bacteria, and this shows the impact of here's all the bacteria that's growing and you can see the treated, everything has been killed. So this type of flexible robotics, a system that could actually provide that um, that disinfection into an unstructured environment, we think is very interesting and has a lot of potential, you know, moving forward. Um, we're also doing some work in manipulation of, of actual poultry product. In this case, uh, one of the really hard problems in, in Birds is is what we, one of the hanging tasks that you see here, and what is what what the person will do is they'll grab this bird, and then they'll put both legs into a shackle. What we're showing right now is just a single leg being picked up and being placed into a shackle. So this is the initial work that we were doing. What we want to be able to do now is to be able to use two arms, okay? So where each arm picks up a leg independently, and then picks it up and then places it into the shackle, okay, together. Um, and the reason why we want to use the two arms is that we've actually worked for years trying to find ways to constrain this problem. And it just turns out it's just such a, 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 a flexible object, okay, and there's such so much size variation that there's really no way uh, that we could find to constrain these objects to be able to force them into a location to be able to do this hanging operation. So now the idea is we can use two robotic arms, again, using that two arm coordination that I showed earlier to be able to pick up the two legs independently and then put them onto the, to the shackle. And um, we think that has um, a lot of uh, potential to be able to solve these types of, of uh, problems where you have so much flexibility in the system. Um, then I want to show one project that we're doing in the ag space uh, because I actually think this has a lot of applications in, in the manufacturing as well. Uh, in this case, we were doing a project um, with USDA to be able to um, look for abiotic stress in peanut plants. And um, the average peanut plant uh, field is 642 acres. So it's not something where you can just, you know, walk the fields and find these types of problems. And you want to be able to find problems as soon as possible. Because once there's moisture or nutrient imbalance, uh, these things can have a huge impact on the plants and their production. And that means real dollars, you know, um, from, from the farmer. So you want to be able to detect things as quickly as possible. Manual scouting is very consistent and very expensive. And it only covers a small portion of the field. UAVs are great at, at, at flying above things. And as I tell people, UAVs are really great at finding once the brown spots or the dead spots have gotten fairly big um, and are very easily seen. But we are trying to detect things as early as possible. And so here's what you see um, 
when you get these abiotic stress. So in this bottom right picture, you can actually see the impact of, of good growth and poor growth. Um, but once you see these things, you don't know what's causing it, okay? So you see that maybe the field is struggling, but you still have to go in and take physical samples. In this case, what you want to be able to take are um, soil samples and leaf samples. And those samples can then be brought back to a laboratory, which will then tell the farmer exactly what is going on. So what we will want to be able to do is use this data in conjunction and to help drive the decision of where to take the actual samples. So what we did also was um, we did some work with Frank Geller at the College of Computing. Um, we built 4D models of the fields. And that's actually what you see down here at the bottom is we're building these 4D models. And this allows us to look at the growth rate of the plants. And it turns out that the growth rate in the canopy is actually a very good indicator of stress in the plants. Now, it doesn't tell us exactly what's causing the stress, but it does tell us that the plants are under stress. So something is going wrong, okay? So this is how we can fly over the fields, collect information, and decide where we need to go uh, to be able to collect samples, okay? Uh, but it doesn't tell us exactly what the problem is. And actually, these growth rate indicators are, are, we can see things long before the plants are turning brown, okay? So this is a very early indicator thing that's going on. So we then, so we, uh, this is some of the data analysis. We look at various parameters and we calculate a stress index. And in the bottom right, you actually see, you know, where the stress points are. And then we can identify locations to actually be able to send in a tractor. And so this is the part which I find very interesting from the manufacturing point of view, is what we do here now is once we get to the plants, we need to take samples. So what we use is uh, an AI system uh, to be able to identify the leaves and actually separate into healthy leaves versus unhealthy leaves, okay? And then once we identify healthy and unhealthy, we actually want to collect five samples of each type. So we identify a healthy and then we go in and we go pick that leaf. So we're not going in to this environment and just picking any leaf. We are actually picking very specific leaves. Okay. So this is what I like to think of as the, the very unstructured problem. Okay. So this is a peanut field. Okay. The plants are completely unstructured. You don't know where the leaves are. The lighting conditions vary. You have to be able to work in bright sunlight, um, cloudy days. Um, you have to work with a little bit of wind. Now we can't work in a, in, you know, a thunderstorm, but we can, we have to be able to work in, you know, five mile per hour uh, or so wind. Um, so, um, that's, so that's why I really like to show this video and talk about this project because it really highlights, uh, to be able to, be able to reach in and grasp objects in that unstructured environment. And you can see this in manufacturing environments having very, some very similar problems. Uh, to this. So I, I do like to talk about that. So one of the things that you've, you've heard me talk about a lot here, uh, when we talk about these different applications, is how we have developed a technology to be able to solve various problems, okay? Um, we sometimes, um, we like to use the word behaviors. Um, so we have a behavior for picking leaves, you know, where you we have the AI to be able to identify healthy and not the not healthy leaves. And then we have the, the control algorithms that allow us to be able to go pick those leaves, even though we don't know where the leaves are ahead of time. And we really don't know where the tractor is relative to the plant. So there's a lot of unknowns there. Um, so this is some work that Stephen Belkersky has been doing, knowledge driven robotics. And I think that this is where is some really important work. And, um, oops. And, what the, the goal of this is, again, is to try to take dumb robots and make them flexible, okay? And by adding the ability to detect and correct errors, okay? Not only are they gonna be at flexible and agile, but they're gonna be able to detect and correct errors. And this is really important. And the thing that we're gonna do is try to develop reusable components of the code such that we can apply this code across, across different projects and domains. So one of the, the, the approach that he's using is, is starting with ontology. And ontology is a fancy word for just saying it's a formal explicit specification of a shared conceptualization. So you have to define all these different terms. You know, what is an end effector? You know, what do you mean by grasp? 
Okay, what do you mean by identify the object? There's all these different things that you have to define. And once you can define these things and really be clear, then we can begin to build up relationships between concepts and classes and these sorts of things that allow us to be able to put things into a structured uh, system. Um, so ontology, ontologies matter because we're dealing with complex situations. You know, all of these different applications I've showed before are really very complex. There's a number of very, um, very specific decisions that the robot has to make uh, in, in everything that it's doing, okay? And what we're trying to do is structure all this so that we can define uh, actions and consequences of the actions, okay? So the system can reason with that knowledge to be able to make the appropriate decisions. Because ultimately what we want is that fully autonomous robot, okay? Where it can make decisions without the human intervention, okay? But we have to structure these things in the right way. And that's what uh, this work is leading towards. Um, so the, the, the foundation of this is this uh, task frame structure, which is defining um, these various things of the command frame, you define what you want to do. And then you define what are the actions and the sequences, sequences of the actions that need to be done. And then they have the results. Okay, how do you evaluate whether the robot actually did what you thought it was going to do? For instance, if, you're, if it's doing a simple pick and place operation, it's picking something up and moving it. Well, how do you know that it actually uh, put the part in the right? Okay, and if it doesn't do it, well, that's an error, and should you do something uh, to correct that? Okay, sometimes it might be just noting that, hey, I had an error on this particular run, that might be sufficient, or it might be a mission critical element where you actually would want to say, okay, I missed that one, now bring me in the next part, and now I will put that back in because that part has to be in that, you know, whatever, okay? And then you also have to know your resources, okay? And the resources are, you know, what type of robot? So we can vary the type of robot, okay? Um, what type of end effector do you have? What type of tool changer do you have? All of these things are important. Now, for the human, it's very simple. You know, we look at the tools that are available to us, we pick up the, the, the right screwdriver, and then we, we do the task. Oops. Um, but, the, but for the robot to make those kinds of decisions is very complicated, and that's why we're putting this on into the structure, okay? And then what we're doing is, this is something on a um, very, what we call just a low level action. In this case, the robot is simply removing um, a nut from a bolt, okay? It's a very simple task, okay? But what you see here um, on the right is the examples of, of the code, okay? It's not defining, hey, move to this position, orient the end effector at this, this particular orientation, and then drive with this number of RPMs in this direction, okay? Because all those are defined at lower levels. This is just saying, you know, you know, move to this, move to where the bolt is, apply this force. Um, so these are the higher level descriptions, okay? But this is still a, a relatively low um, level action. And then you sequence these actions to be able to get the result that you want done, okay? And then what you can do is you can actually put, now put these things together and use a higher level planning system. So in this case, they're using an AI planning system which is being able to take um, a very complex task and string together all of the necessary actions and the, the preconditions and the postconditions for each action to know that the robot has achieved the task, okay? In this task, what, um, what was asked of was to move this part, this white piece of plastic right here, and move it from there over to here. But it's actually bolted in to the robot because the robot knows these different conditions and it has these different actions. It can seek, put together a sequence of operations to be able to achieve the high level task, which is move the part. And now you see it's moving it over and placing it in uh, to, the, um, to the location B. Yes, this is, a, you know, we understand this is, you know, not an example of what you'd be actually doing in a manufacturing environment, but what it does show is the ability to be able to sync together a series of tasks to do 
to do something. And we're doing all this without writing the low level code. And that's what we want to be able to get away from. Okay. Because every manufacturing facility, um, that's always one of the problems that they have is, you know, with, with as the SKU numbers is increased as the product diversity and increases and you don't have these long, um, you know, run times. Okay. You might want to do something, you know, run for half a day. Being able to write that code becomes very expensive. Okay. This type of, of code where you bring together the different steps and the AI is able to put it, the, the AI does the, the planning. Now we're able to develop, um, real, uh, oops, uh, real solutions to problems, um, without having to write every line of code, uh, to move the robot to do every single step. Okay. And we think that that's going to have just a huge impact, um, in the, um, the, the ability to bring robots into so many uh, more application areas, small and medium sized enterprises. Okay, where they just lack the resources or, the, you know, to be able to write all that code, um, right now that if they have this type of toolbox, you know, they'll be able to say, Hey, I can use that robot now. Cause now I just have to define these higher level tasks and it knows the behaviors and knows the actions to be able to achieve uh, the input. I think that's really, really has a huge impact. So uh, in conclusion, you know, you know, what I have to say is, you know, the robots are moving out of the cages on the manufacturing floor. You know, they're going to be, you know, we want to use them in more and more applications. But as we start working in these more, these different types of applications, is we need the robots to be more in intelligent, more autonomous. Okay. So we need to be able to have, to add the sensing in the environment and reacting to the environment. And that's what the first projects I showed were uh, the different types of, of robots that were sensing and responding to the environment, the cutting robot, you know, to be able to sense and visualize the bird make decisions, come up with unique cutting trajectories, and then execute those. But then the next thing you want to be able to do is how do I bring all of these behaviors together in a knowledge-driven robotics software uh, format so that I can apply that these behaviors across many, many different applications, ones that are far beyond anything that I might have originally conceived of, okay? But the behaviors are really all the same, okay? And it's just how you put them together. And I think if we can start you know, building these types of behaviors, being able to put them in this construct, we'll be able to see robots move into more of these unstructured environments, okay, where they can actually make the decisions on their own and truly uh, um, operate as an autonomous or independent system. And I think that that is the, the big promise of the work that we're doing, is being able to um, you know, to facilitate um, that work. And that's something that we're all very, very excited about. So uh, again, I just want to say, hey, thank you very much for uh, your time and listening to this presentation. And also, I wanted to thank uh, all the, the people who have worked on all this incredible work uh, that I presented today. It's this amazing team that we have here at GTRI doing some incredible things. And I just want to say thank you to all of them uh, for their great work. And I am more than happy to take any and all questions uh, that you might have at this point. Thank you, Gary. That was fascinating. Um, and if any audience members have questions, please go ahead and use the Q&A panel on your computer to submit questions. Um, while we wait for those to come in, Gary, you talked about a lot of fascinating environments in which you work, um, these various unstructured environments. Is there any one unstructured environment you've encountered that you think is um, has been the most challenging so far or the most um, interesting? Well, I, I think that they're all very, very interesting and challenging in their own ways. Um, you know, I think that in, man, in, in just the traditional manufacturing environment, um, you know, I was down at uh, Warner Robins and I was visiting their facility and where they do disassembly of planes, uh, fix parts and then reassemble <laughs> the planes. And, you know, every type of, of, of plane has thousands of different variations and it's, it's an incredibly complicated area and you know that's something which is just uh, fascinating to me because you know i think in some ways it's it's the worst of all cases uh because some of the parts they don't have cad drawings for the uh, for the parts anymore and it's been out in the field uh running so things are bent things are uh <laughs> are not at right angles anymore 
So uh, there's a lot of, of decision making that has to go on in that space. And I think that that's um, an area that I, I think if we if we can solve that, then we'll be able to solve a lot of other things. Um, that are out there. But I think any manufacturing environment, you know, there, as I said, every one that I go to, you know, the, the robots are doing a certain number of tasks, but there's always people there doing so many more tasks. And um, and they're doing it because it's difficult. It's not easy. Thank you. Um, and I know Georgia Tech does, does a lot of work uh, in the aerospace field. Um, so that was, that was an interesting example that you chose. Uh, it looks like we have one question from Keith uh, Dalsett. What's an example of a camera-based vision system being insufficient? Does your team or field have interest in other optical sensing tools, for example, LiDAR? So, um, so I'll answer the second part of that first. Uh, yes, we actually do a lot of things besides uh, pure um, imaging. Uh, cameras. Um, we do uh, LIDAR, we do uh, all kinds of different things. So um, the, the stream of data is somewhat, uh, can be varied. I you know, definitely agree with that. Um, Camera-based um, vision systems being insufficient. Uh, yes, there are times when they are insufficient. And some of that can be because of the size of the object, uh, the variability of, of, the, of the product. You know, you just can't quite capture everything. Um, uh, sometimes it's the um, reflectivity of the, of the product um, and things like this, which can make things difficult on the imaging side. So, yes, there are always are going to be times when um, you know, camera-based vision system doesn't is not the right solution, and and you have to go to other things. And those other things can be, of course, the easiest is trying to force things into a structured environment, but then other things might be saying, okay, let's go to a less dynamic solution, okay, and let's use uh, LIDAR systems uh, or some, some other imaging system, which allows us to be able to, to capture where the object is, and now we assume that it's not going to move, or we constrain it such that it doesn't move, so that we can go pick it up and then manipulate it. So the, um, the image-based systems, the really beauty of that uh, is the dynamic nature of the problem. So in the case like we're picking leaves, um, that the leaves might be moving a little bit, okay, as you go to pick. So being able to respond to things. And also that we didn't need absolute perfect calibration, okay? Um, because you're on a tractor in a real field, maintaining robot calibration is almost impossible. So uh, being able to do things that are slightly uncalibrated is really a big uh, benefit. Um, but that's not always the right solution for every problem. Thank you. It uh, looks like we have a couple of more questions that have come in. The next question is from Jerry. Uh, for the robotic manipulation, does the system need to have some pre-knowledge, such as the shape of a chicken wing or other information like this? So, uh, yes, um, we do make some assumptions um, about some of the, the things that we are grasping. So, for instance, when we were picking up that whole chicken with the, by the legs, uh, if you notice, we're actually using some sort of a hook mechanism, and the assumption of that is uh, that on the, the leg, the, the joint is slightly bigger, so it gives you, so you can use a hook, you know, uh, kind of a V-shaped, you know, hook to be able to, to grab it. Uh, so there are some assumptions made in, in that area. In tip, you know, typically, at least in the manufacturing world, you know, having some, you know, pre-knowledge of what you're picking up definitely helps. Uh, for instance, suction cups work really good if you have flat or uh, or if you know it's curved, you can have a curved indefector or have some flexibility into there. But uh, suction cups don't work really well if it's if the object is really wet. Uh, so if we're picking up like poultry, um, you know, if it's really wet, that has some problems. Um, but actually, you know, it works fairly well. But having some knowledge of shape ahead of time certainly does help. I know there's a lot of research being done um, to move away from that um, that constraint, but that was not a uh, that was not the focus of this work. Okay, thank you. And another question related to the camera, and that is, uh, does the camera need to be fixed, or can the camera move as needed? So yeah, that's an interesting question. Um, 
So it depends on the type of control that you are, that you are doing. Um, if you're doing the traditional um, image-based uh, control where you, ha you have a fixed, uh, uh, you, you do need a fixed camera and because you have to have a, a very careful calibration uh, between the, um, the camera and, and the robot. Um, but some of the work that we have done in this um, image-based visual surveying um, we can actually use a series of cameras, and they could be uh, fixed or actually on the on the robot. So they can actually be an eye in hand, where the the, the camera is actually located in the end effector, or it can be mode like uh, mounted on one of the joints of the robot, so it's looking. Um, in this case, um, those algorithms uh, don't require calibration, um, so we can actually use those in very dynamic environments. Um, and that gives us tremendous, you know, flexibility uh, to be able to work. Um, but it also does come at a, a little bit of a price, you know, as well. So, so it depends on exactly what type of control you're doing, uh, as to whether you need fixed or moving cameras. So we we've used both. Thank you. Uh, looks like we have one more question. Is uh, oh, okay. It was just a response from. Uh, Sorry, since we have the audience members muted, um, there's a little delay here. But uh, Jerry, just thank you, thank you for your um, response. A very exciting work. It looks like we do have one other question that has just come in, and that is, uh, what language is your team using? Is industry or is the industry standard for coding, processing, vision data? Does iOS offer convenient vision integration? So um, that's a good question. So um, you know, right now in in the robotics world, you know, in industry, it's uh, every every robotic company has their own proprietary link, okay, um, which is built specific for their robot. So that makes uh, it very difficult to use uh, to um, to be cross-platform, to be able to the to, to code to work on one robot manufacturer and then work on a different robot manufacturer. Uh, what Ross provides is a um, is a standard messaging system. So that it can actually work across multiple robotic platforms. Okay. So you write um, your 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 code in, in C++, um, and you can um, integrate uh, use ROS as a messaging system so that it can now with if you have a driver for that robot, it can now communicate or recognize it, what kind of robot that you have. But it's the and then you will know its physical parameters, and then you can issue commands to that robot. Uh, in via the driver in a standard way, so that the the code running on the robot can then take in and uh, interpret those commands and execute the um, the correct commands. So we've actually shown demos where we will be running on a universal robotics robot, and then we take the exact same code, hook it up to a um, a Fanuc, and the Fanuc robot which is a different size, different, um, I think it's the same, same degree, number of degrees of freedom, and then, but it will execute the exact same code and, and do the exact same uh, process. So it will do the same task without us changing a line of code in the system. Um, so uh, within ROS, I said ROS is really a messaging system. So there are packages for doing image processing uh, that are available you know, to, uh, to you. So you really have your entire you know, plethora of choices on on vision and integration, but there's some that are built into ROS that you can use. So it is a nice way of, um, I think, a, a nice platform to do the um, robotic um, development. Very interesting. Thank you. So those are all the questions that I see for now, but in closing, um, I would like to thank you, Gary, for your time today and all of the um, information you've shared. It's a lot to take in and uh, a lot of exciting work taking place at GTRI. Um, I also want to thank our audience members for joining us today, and I'd like to invite you to also log in next Monday at noon uh, when our speaker will be uh, Dr. Dragos Azinte who will be presenting on approaches for in-depth studies of workplace uh, workpiece surface integrity and machining. Uh, he is a professor with the University of Nottingham in the UK. 
So uh, keep a lookout for announcements. We will be sending out the email and I think we'll be sharing um, those announcements via social media, such as LinkedIn as well. And today's lecture has been recorded and will be shared on the Georgia Tech Manufacturing Institute website. So if you would like to go back and refer to it, or if you have colleagues or friends who are unable to attend, um, please feel free to uh, invite them to visit our website so that they can view the presentation as well. Thank you again and have a good afternoon, everyone. Thank you, goodbye.